figure it out. Yes, the Sunday school kids are enjoying root beer floats right now. <laughs> so if you want to, yeah, if you want to quietly depart out the back, I'll understand. Uh, all right. So today's passage um, comes from the Old Testament book of Chronicles, which is one of kind of the history-based Old Testament books. There are several books in the Old Testament that really are just history books, um, where they write down uh, various things about the various kings um, that existed for all those hundreds of years. Um, and we're told today uh, that the story we're reading today comes from the time of King Josiah. Now, King Josiah actually became king when he was eight years old. Having raised two children who at one point were eight years old, I'm like, that's a gutsy move. Uh, <laughs> but he also comes at this time, and I remember a couple of years ago we did a sermon series actually about this, but he comes at this time when there was actually a succession of kings, and most of them were pretty bad. Um, and, uh, and, and there was a succession of kings at this time in Israel, um, and a lot of them didn't do their job, but didn't do their job well. Um, so I'm sure they're like, well, fine, let's, let's just let the kid have a try. Uh, he can't do any worse uh, than all these adults that have been messing it up for these last couple of centuries. Um, and Josiah doesn't mess it up, um, and actually goes on to be uh, one of the rare, um, actually really good kings uh, in that time uh, in the history uh, of God's people. As he gets older um, and is kind of coming to terms with what, who he is and what he is he's supposed to be doing, um, he takes a look around and he starts um, a series of reforms. Uh, and he looks around the kingdom and he sees what's good and what isn't. And really, at this point in history, one of the things that has happened is uh, because the leadership has been so weak, um, there really isn't a lot of unity um, amongst God's people at this time, um, and a bunch of other influences and other things have crept in um, to the point that the temples that really should just be temples to God um, now had all these other things um, in them from basically neighboring kingdoms and neighboring gods and all this sort of stuff. Uh, and Josiah looks around and says, I don't think this is right. This is you know, we are here as God's people, um, we should be acting as such. Um, and so he starts a series of reforms, and one of the things that he decides to reform first and foremost is the actual main temple in Jerusalem, um, which um, had fallen into a little bit of disrepair um, at this time. Uh, and the reason it had fallen into disrepair is the money that the temple was collecting, instead of spending it on the temple and maintenance and all those things they should do, um, the priests who were in charge at that time were basically hoarding it all. And so jo Josiah finds out that, oh, like the temple actually doesn't look all that great and isn't in great shape, but they've got plenty of money. Um, so he basically goes in and cleans out the temple treasury, gives it to the people who should be taking care of it and maintaining it, um, and sets apart this like large remodel project um, to kind of bring the temple back uh, into uh, the status that it should and probably be in. In the process of this renovation, as anybody who's ever done, anybody ever done a major renovation, like on an old house or something, and you start tearing things down and you find things you didn't expect to find? Or when you're tearing down a school, you find a bunch of stuff you didn't mean to find? <laughs> See, Ledford. Um, who boy. Uh, well, that's what basically happened here. They start tearing this thing down, and it's very, very old at this time, and they start remodeling it, and they find something, and the th one of the things that they find um, is what Josiah calls and what we record as the Book of the Law. And at what we understand today and what we pretty are certain of today is the book that they find um, is what would eventually become the book of Deuteronomy in the Bible. Uh, there was a period in time in which that book was lost, so they had the four books instead of the five, um, and Josiah is the king, and they find it when they're remodeling the temple, um, and when the priests bring it to them, they read it to him, and I, I love how it's like one line. They're like, and then he read, they read to him the entirety of the book of the law. Well, if you don't know, the book of Deuteronomy is actually pretty long, right? It's not a small book. Like, I assume he had to like have a snack break like in the middle there. Um, but that's what it says. They said they read him the whole thing. Um, and one of the things the book of the Deuteronomy has um, is a lot of language. It has a lot of rules in it because the first five books are just full of rules. Uh, it had a lot of rules in it. Uh, but it also had all this language about with, between Moses and God and the covenant that existed between folks um, and the, the reality of how God was telling Moses how he wanted the people to live and why he wanted to live that way because they were his people. Uh, and Josiah is really distressed to find out that there was all this stuff that they were supposed to be doing that they didn't know they were supposed to be doing, thus weren't doing it. And so we get to this scene where Josiah calls together all of the people of Israel, 
or at least all the people in Jerusalem who are, you know, close by, um, and has the whole book of the law read to them, which, again, probably took a while, um, you know, but apparently there wasn't a lot else to do. So, so he reads the whole book of the law to them and says, this, we, we now need, we know what the covenant is. We know better what it is we're supposed to do to live into the covenant. And he invites folks, well, invites probably not the right word, um, but uh, what ends up happening is he, he wants the people now to recommit themselves to this covenant that existed between them and God. And Josiah really sees that the path forward for Israel as a country is to recommit themselves um, to the covenant and that, to living in the way that God wants them to live. So, and his hope is, in by doing so, they can once again find some unity as a people um, that he knew and felt they were lacking. Uh, so part of that was not only knowing the rules and knowing the covenant, but also then was getting rid of all of the really annoying words that are hard to read. So, uh, all the abominations. Um, so that was Josiah's work, um, and he's recorded as being a good king, and these reforms were recorded as being uh, really necessary and important and really bringing life and vitality back um, to uh, God and God's people at that time. This idea of covenant, right, that this idea of covenant is more than contract, right? It's not just a simple, you do this, I do this, you do this, I do this, right? We talk about, when we talk about covenant at all um, today, which we don't talk about it a lot, um, we talk about covenant at all today, it usually comes up in the context of marriage, right? We will talk about the covenant of marriage because marriage is more than just a contractual agreement, right, to, to do your taxes and share your banking information, right? I mean, it is more than that, and we know it is more than that. And yes, there are some responsibilities and expectations that come with the covenant of marriage, but the idea of it and the hope of a, a, a good marriage is that you are making something together that is greater than either of you could do alone, right? And so the purpose of covenant is that idea of bonding, that idea of mutual relationship, mutual respect. So God's people are invited to be in a covenant with God not just for a contractual you do, I do kind of basis, but because God wants them to be united to do something bigger and more important, be part of something bigger and more important than they could ever be on their own. So that is the nature of covenant, and it brings with it um, a lot of expectations, a lot of hope, um, and a, a lot of uh, requirements, um, and hopefully a lot of gifts and a lot of blessings. Hopefully, most people experience the covenant of marriage as a blessing in your life. And if you don't, don't tell the person sitting next to you. At least not now. But that's the hope and expectation. When we say marriage is working, that's what we know. So God wants his covenant with his people to bring hope and life to them as well. Now, fast forward uh, many, many years um, till we get to John Wesley's time. Because obviously we're talking about John Wesley because we're talking about John Wesley's prayer. Um, John Wesley finds himself in an interesting time that is not actually terribly dissimilar um, from the time that Josiah finds himself in. Um, by the time we get to about 1755, Methodism is sort of a thing, uh, right? There's people around, they've got some organization, they know what they're doing, uh, and uh, it's kind of in that kind of adult phase uh, of life, um, and it's having some impact uh, on the world, but not quite all of the impact that Wesley wants it to, because Wesley really intended the Methodist movement to be a reform movement of the church in which he belonged. He never intended it to be a different denomination or a different religious group. Um, he fought that his entire life. He never actually left the Church of England, um, even after Methodism kind of was clear was going to go its own way, um, because mostly because John Wesley's beef at the time, the reason he thought Methodism needed to exist, um, was not because he disagreed with the beliefs of the church of his day. He didn't disagree with the beliefs of the church of England, um, not at all, but what he disagreed with and what he was challenging them to was to consider how they were acting and how they were behaving, right? Methodism has actually always been a movement that is far more about what it is that we do and how it is that we behave in the world um, and was not necessarily fund founded on any kind of difference of belief, right? So it wasn't like a theological difference uh, that Wesley had that led him to want to do this, but he looked around and he said, the church today doesn't seem to be living out its faith in the way that we ought to. And, and really, he w what he was saying there is like, the church today doesn't actually seem to be, or the church of his day, 
doesn't seem to be living into the covenant um, that we have, not just through the Old Testament, but the covenant we now have through Christ, right? Uh, that the church has sort of lost its way, um, not so much in belief, but lost its way in what it is that it was doing. Um, so he takes that, he takes that understanding and that belief and kind of in, puts it into the Methodist movement that, that we are to behave and we are to act in a certain way. And the way that we are to act is, is as if we believe that the covenant we have with God, the covenant we have through Christ is real and is powerful and should be important and should be honored. That's what he wanted people to do. So in 1755, he starts up his first covenant service, uh, which would later on go on to be something that uh, Methodists regularly practice uh, around New Year's. Um, and so he starts his first covenant service um, as, as uh, where am I? There I am. Okay. He starts his first covenant service um, in August of 1755, records that 1,800 people were there, um, which that man could draw a crowd like you wouldn't believe. Uh, <laughs> And then invites them as part of that service to basically re-remember and reaffirm their covenant with God. And as that service would grow and mature um, later on, the prayer that we had today, um, in front of us today, would become the central prayer um, of that service. So John Wesley's covenant prayer, um, as is outlined, really wasn't ever intended to be something that you would say on a daily basis or anything like that. Um, you can, sure, you can say whatever prayer you want on a daily basis, um, but that really wasn't the intent. The intent was it was something that would be that you would come to on like a semi-regular basis and really take time uh, to think on and reflect and pray about, uh, and then really use it as an opportunity to remember and reestablish that covenant that each and every one of us has, each and every one of us is invited into through God. And he does it in this really interesting way. Now, this is actually based on a previous prayer, Wesley tells us, but we don't have the text of the previous one, so we don't know how much of this was him and how much of this was, was before. Um, so this is all generally quoted, now considered Wesley's thing. And if you read through the prayer, um, you can see it's, a, it's really a series of contrasting statements that almost seem contradictory, right? And if, and if we're not careful, that's kind of how we can read it. What in reality is happening is, is what Wesley's doing is he's laying out the two extremes, right? He's saying this over here, extreme this way, or this over here, extreme that way. Now, um, I said we were doing this in the book study, um, so some of you are in there in our, our book study uh, that we're doing right now on prayer. Um, that book study had, that, that first day we did that had a very interesting response to this prayer that I wasn't actually expecting, but I really enjoyed. So if any of you have done a book study with me, you know that uh, I don't pick books that I necessarily think you're always going to agree with. I pick books that prompt good conversation. And that's always my disclaimer at the beginning. This author, the author of whatever we're reading is not himself Jesus. Uh, he is not going to be perfect. You can disagree. And there was a few people, boy howdy, did they disagree. Uh, uh, and really, I get it. And I really, after a while, I kind of got it because that first section is a challenging to us um, because that idea of I am no longer my own but thine, put me to what my wilt, rank me to whom I wilt. The author in the book that we were reading um, really plays up that as this idea of surrender, right? Um, and that that we are called to do there is surrender. Um, and that is not a, w a word that many of us like, um, I think, and especially in our time and our place, uh, surrender is not considered a good thing, right? We all kind of have this like never give up, never surrender, you know, kind of attitude about stuff. If you know the quote, you're my favorite people. <laughs> but that is kind of it. We don't think of surrender, we don't often think of surrender um, as a, you know, as a positive thing, as a good thing, right? Um, you know, that's what happens when you lose, and none of us want to lose. Um, and, and he really kind of, the author kind of really pumps on that uh, more than I actually think is, more than I think is actually, uh, than, more than what Wesley actually intended. I think when Wesley um, wrote those words, um, he is not saying that, you know, he is not inviting us to take like a passive role in life right? He is not t inviting us to take, uh, you know, just, you know, take whatever comes and not really worry about anything. John Wesley worried about everything all the time. Um, he was very bad at that, if that was his goal. Um, he, he's, not, he's not asking us to basically, you know, take abuse. He's not asking any of that. What he is instead reminding us is, in that thing, this idea um, is that God is in 
anything and everything we do. And what we are called to do is to recognize the fact that God is in everything and anything we do, the important stuff and the mundane stuff. So when he says, I am no longer thine but yours, put me to what you will, he's basically saying, in all the things that you are in my life, in all the things in my life, God, help me make sure that I'm doing them in the way that you want me to, in the way that brings life, in a way that helps me love you, love my neighbor, love myself better. He's basically saying we have the opportunity to practice that no matter what we're doing or where we're doing it. Right? He was trying to break down that idea that church and religion and faith is something that happens for a couple hours on Sunday morning and the rest of the time it doesn't matter. He's telling people in the beginning, whatever it is you do, however it is you spend your day, wherever it is you work, whoever it is you hang out with, God is there and he is part of that. And we should be asking ourselves constantly this question of, are we doing everything we do in the way that God would want us to do it, in a way that brings life? and reminding ourselves that we have the opportunity to do everything we are doing in a way that brings life. So if you want to call that surrender, that's fine. But I think my problem with using that word is that prior, it tends to invoke the idea of taking a more passive role than I think Wesley would ever want us to. Wesley was incredibly actively engaged in life and called on us to. Um, so that's the first time I disagreed with the author. It wasn't the last. I'm like, I just write my own books at this point, I've decided, because. Anyway, um, so the other thing, he, he keeps on going, he keeps on going, and he said, the next session says, put me to doing, put me to suffering. That's another one that can be a, a challenge for us. Like, what does he mean by that? Um, I think what Wesley's really primarily getting at there is that a life of faithfulness, a life following God, is not guaranteed and rarely will be easy, right? That part of living, part of following God, part of being alive, part of doing what God calls us to do, means that we will be called on to do hard work. And we will do hard work, both for ourselves and for others. And when we're doing that hard work, we should recognize that God is, probably, is alive and working and working through that work. That the hard work we do is not just for our own benefit, but it's for the benefit of building the kingdom of God. So Wesley is reminding us in that, says, put me to doing and put me to suffering. He's saying that sometimes the hard work's going to be hard. We're not going to want to do it. It's going to come. It's sometimes going to be painful. It's sometimes going to be difficult, but that doesn't mean it should be avoided. He is not elevating the idea of suffering for suffering's sake. Wesley was all about relieving suffering where he could and calls on us to do the same. We are called to do that. But sometimes the hard work that we have to do will involve hard work, and it will involve pain, and it will involve things that we understand sometimes to be suffering. He also goes on to say uh, things like, let me be exalted and let me be, you know, whatever. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but, he also, but what he means there is like what the work that we are doing for God, sometimes it will be in public, sometimes it will be in private. It can happen in both places, and that's okay. Um, he says, you know, let me, uh, where'd it go? Do, do, do. Um, you know, let me have all things, let me have nothing. Sometimes the work we do will be rewarded, sometimes it won't. That does not mean that God is not working in it even if we do not feel we're being rewarded for it at all times. Wesley is reminding us of the extremes, knowing that we actually live life in the middle. And if God can be found in the extremes, then obviously we can find God in the middle as well. So if I have a disagreement um, with the book that we are reading, and I'm not making any of you want to read it that aren't in this book study, I can tell right now, um, is that he is focusing a little bit more on the one side on the suffering have not whatever side, and not recognizing the brilliance of what Wesley is doing uh, by making sure that we understand all sides, all parts of the spectrum can be part of what God is doing. Sometimes the peace that we need, want, and desire can only be found by working through the grief that we are feeling at that moment. When we lose somebody we love, or something is taking from us that we don't want to have taken from us, there is a process of grief that we have to go through. We may experience that as suffering, but God is with us in that, and the reward we get on the other side of it is the peace we seek. And we get ourselves in trouble when we try to skip the part in the middle and go right from the pain to the peace without recognizing there is a process that has to happen. We have to process our grief. 
when things to happen that we don't want to happen and we get angry about it, we don't want to stay angry forever, but there's a time when we are inevitably going to be angry. And the goal is to get through that anger, hopefully without hurting ourselves or others, so that we can again find the peace on the other side. Again, none of this is about suffering for suffering's sake. So it's easy, I think, sometimes for us um, to focus, as the author did, on the one side of it. Um, this idea of, you know, you know, kind of what we kind of consider negative side of things. But he doesn't say, and never in there in anything does he say, that the other side is inherently bad. So there's two I want to talk about. One is this idea of being exalted. Now, we don't probably think of the word exalted all that often, right? Because we don't live necessarily in John Wesley's world. John Wesley world lived in a world with kings and queens, right? And lords and ladies and all these really important people um, that were, you know, important because they were important because they were born into the right family. Um, and so this idea of somebody being exalted would be something that, you know, they understood. Um, and it's interesting that Wesley doesn't actually say anywhere in this that that's a bad thing. He says, let me be exalted, right? And frankly, in Wesley's time, Wesley kind of was. Wesley was a really popular guy. He was somebody that many, many people listened to. It's argued that before the invention of the radio, more people had heard John Wesley's voice than anybody else because he would preach one or two times a day for like 50 years all across the country, right? More people heard John Wesley preach than anybody else and arguably heard his voice more than any other voice in history. Um, you know, and he was well-regarded and sometimes not well-regarded. Um, sometimes he was celebrated. Sometimes they threw bricks at him. Literally, it's in his thing. It's in, it, it, there's some great stories in his journal. Um, uh, and he can pull together 1,800 people for a covenant service because he was that well-known, that respected, that, if we will, exalted. So being exalted necessarily isn't, isn't necessarily um, the bad thing. Josiah, the king in the passage we read at the beginning, was exalted as a king, not by choice. He was eight when he was made king, right? He didn't choose it or seek it. It was just something that happened to him, whether he wanted to or not. So the question that Wesley has for himself and Josiah has for himself is, I am in this place. People are look, look, looking to me and listening to me. What then am I going to do with it? Should I run away from it? Or is there a way to use it for God's good work? So when Wesley says, let me be exalted, it's not for our own benefit so we can walk around going, hey, I'm pretty awesome. Though most of you are pretty awesome. It's so that we can recognize, so that we can use it for God's purposes. Now, again, we don't talk a lot about exalting people today. However, I think we do it, and we probably do it more today um, than, than we did before, than we have even in, in the past. If you were to ask kids, um, and especially boys, but most, a lot of kids, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, what do you want to be, right? What would they tell you? They'd, a lot of them would say, I want to be a professional athlete, right? And let's be honest, like, I, I never said that because I knew it was never in the cards, right? I was a little bit more realistic than that. Um, but a lot of times, like, some of those kids genuinely just wanted to play the game. But for a lot of them, you want to be a professional athlete because you want to be important, right? You want to be on TV. Nobody wants to be the professional athlete that sits on the bench and has the trading card nobody wants, right? It was about having some influence, about having respect, about having people care about you and what you do, right? It's a lot of reasons people be famous. Today, we have, if you ask your kids today what you want, them, what they want to do, an unnerving number of them will tell you they want to be on YouTube, right? Because YouTube influencer, Instagram influencer, all this thing is a thing now, right? And, you know, many of you may not participate that, that's fine, but I promise you, your kids and your grandkids do, right? They have people they watch online for all sorts of reasons. And there's all sorts of categories in which you can be an influencer um, and, in fact, make money. That, I would argue, really is the modern-day incarnation of what it is to be exalted, right? I want to be somebody that people, you know, an exalted person somebody looks to, somebody, somebody that some people listen to, somebody who has influence over people and their opinion of things, People, it's somebody who has an opinion that others care about. And being an influencer in life comes in big, big places. You may be a YouTube star that's getting a million views a week. Good for you. If you are, I haven't seen you there. Let me know. Um, but it also comes in much smaller places, right? Most of us will not have influence over tens of thousands of people. Most of us will, at some point, have influence and authority over a small number of people. 
I remembered as I was writing this, uh, when I was in high school, um, I was part of the Future Homemakers of America, because yes, I was. They don't call it that anymore. But, uh, and one of the things that uh, our FHA chapter did is we ran the concession stand uh, for boys' basketball games. And my freshman year, I got to be part of that. And I really enjoyed it. And so my next year, uh, the next year, uh, the gal who was running it graduated. So I got to be in charge of it. So I had to order all the food. I got to put everything out. And it was fantastic. And I loved it. Um, and I thought it was a tremendous amount of fun. And we got through like the first three games. Um, and I had everything set up the way that I wanted. it. And I'm like, we're going to make some changes. We should be doing this over here. This seems to be over here. We're going to make this a little bit different. And I did all these things. And about the fourth game, somebody came to me, and they're like, nobody wants to volunteer for the concession stand today. I'm like, why? Because they don't want to work with you. I'm like, why? It's like, because you keep telling everybody what to do. And you keep acting like you're like the king of this place. And I'm like, well, I am in charge. <laughs> and I remember I got to have a really interesting and fun conversation with our home ec teacher, who, which of course was the head of the FHA, about what it is, that how, what it I was doing and why it was incorrect. Um, and I got a lesson that day about influence and what it means to have influence, what it means to have authority, um, and what it is that we are intending to do with it. it having that ability, being the one that has authority, one of the things that Wesley would, would say, and I think we would all agree to say, that the people who do that right, the people who do it well, are the ones that let the praise run down to those below us and let the responsibility and the blame roll up to those of us who are in charge. That is the way John Wesley expects us to run. If you are a person of, if you are an exalted person, if you're a person of influence, you're a person of that, you need to be a person of influence not for your own benefit and gain, but for those around you. And many of us throughout life will have an opportunity to do that. Many of us in life will have either a classroom full of kids in front of us, or some people who work for us, or a group that we are a part of, we will have the opportunity to be the one that people are looking towards, whether it's a handful or hundreds, and we have a question about what do we do in that time and that place. Well, the question should be, how do we use this influence that we have to be the hands and feet of Christ in that place, to be the bearer of the good news in that place? How do we do it, even if we're in a place where we can't use those words, because that's not a place those words are used, how do we still reflect the grace and peace and love that we have and show it to those around us. John Wesley doesn't say being influenced is bad by any means. He says if you are one, use it for God. And then finally, he talks about this idea um, uh, basically let me have everything or let me have nothing. Wesley lives in an interesting time because up until about really close to Wesley's time, um, especially in England, wealth was directly uh, tied to land. If you were wealthy, it's because you had land. And all of the land in England was already all carved up. As opposed to the country where we live in, right, where the biggest landowner in the United States is actually the federal government, no, there was no public land in Wesley's time. It was all owned by somebody. The lords and the important people had carved it up centuries before. And so that's how you were wealthy. Until we started to invent ships and trade and those sorts of things. And now suddenly there was this new class of people. They called it originally the merchant class. But there was a new class of people who could make money independent of having land because they had ships or they had trade routes or they had those sorts of things. So now you had this whole new group of people who were not noble, and before all the rich people were noble, who were not noble, who were not born you know, into it, but were people who generated and created their wealth through trade. And there's this whole other group, and, nobody, and it was still a time where nobody's quite sure what to do with those people, right? And how it is that they should behave in the world. So Wesley is writing this at a time when he says, let me have everything, basically, at a time when that was, in fact, possible in a way that had never been possible before, right? The world that we live in, where we love to tell these stories about how somebody, you know, starts a small business that turns into this big multi-million dollar thing, those things happen now. They were only just starting to happen when Wesley was around, and before that, they never happened. It did not exist. It was not something that could happen. And so they were asking themselves, what is, our, what is the expectation of these people who now have been able to accumulate all of this wealth. Wesley will say in this prayer and also other places that the wealth, isn't, wealth is not a bad thing. Some people's spiritual gift is making money. I love those people. They're really handy to have around. Wesley also says, and will say over and over again, that if that is us and we are blessed with much, 
than we are expected. Christ expects us, God expects us, expects us to use what we have for God's good purposes. The problem isn't being wealthy and the problem isn't being poor. The problem is what is it we do with what it is that we have and what it is we have been given. And if we have given much, then we are expected to be generous much. That's how it works. This prayer is inherently a prayer about action. It is a prayer about doing. It is a prayer about covenant. It is a prayer about recognizing the responsibility that we have as God's people under God's covenant. And it's a prayer about remembering all the blessings we receive from being God's people. Because at the end of all of this, Wesley's expectation is then, and ours should be today, that if we do truly live the way that God calls us to live, if we do truly take into account in all the things we do what God would have us do, that though it may be hard and difficult at times, at the end of the day, there is still joy, there is peace, and the secret to a good life is to recognizing the covenant we have been given and learning how to express that in our each individual lives with what we each individually have. Different ones of us will think of ourselves on different sides of the extremes John Wesley puts in these prayers, and that's fine. There is actually no wrong side to be on. The only question is, what do we do with wherever it is that we are? So, as we close out this morning, I'm going to invite you to join in with me, either on the blue sheets or it's on the screen, as we pray together John Wesley's Covenant Prayer. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside by thee. Exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thine pleasure and disposal. And now, O gracious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine, and I am thine, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Amen. I just stand.